All right, so we are going to talk about a lot of different technology, and we're going to start with talking about the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things, um, IoT, really just means anything with a chip that shares data wirelessly. And anything with a chip can be hacked. So at Northampton, we have a smart apartment learning lab. We have um, we've a dedicated space where you can come in. It's free for students. It's free for the faculty to use. It's free for the community to come in and use. We've built an escape room within the smart apartment to sort of highlight some of the technology. And it really is an opportunity for students, faculty in the community to think about the world they live in and sort of the underpinning issues that go with all of the different technologies that help us, you know, make life easier, right? Um, the focus of the room is to help build, break, and defend these kinds of technologies and to think about them critically in the placement that they have in our lives. So in, in the smart apartment, we have a smart fridge, we have um, Alexa devices that power most of the room, a smart microwave, we have a smart bed, we have um, an, a, a biometric bank, we have all different kinds of technologies that help students really think about the world they live in. And you might think, well, how would I use that in class? Well, we use a lot of we use a lot of um, formulas about the technology, and so there are ways to apply this no matter what the discipline is. So it's very exciting and it's a lot of fun. And if you're interested in in the space, uh, just yesterday, Campus Technology released a podcast about it. Um, I will share links about a virtual tour. You can kind of see the smart apartment virtually. And you can use the smart apartment virtually without ever having to come to campus if, if you can't if they make it physically there. So I do want to do a little shout out and some housekeeping while I'm thinking about it. Uh, Sandy Hannigan, who's with me, is part of the LA team at Northampton, and she was very, um, very instrumental in the presentation together. So much appreciation to her. Um, and then the team at, our, at Northampton is really amazing. So this is a team effort. Certainly, this isn't work that I do alone by myself. Um, we have uh, uh, Sarah Burton, who has, um, who really oversees the smart apartment now. She does an amazing job um, with Sandy and uh, with a, a fellow named Joe, and they run the smart apartment for different groups. And so last night they had a big group that came in, and they did a tour of our fab lab, which Northampton has an amazing fab lab. Um, they did a classroom activity, and they did uh, an activity in the smart apartment. So the space, the space and generated by a team effort. So um, we recently won an award for innovation for the Smart Apartment Learning Lab, and it's based all on Internet of Things technology. So um, Internet of Things, and I won't read this to you, is just everything connected through wirelessly. Anything with a chip can be hacked, so that's really important. Uh, one of the most powerful things in the room is a diffuser that costs $19.99 on, on Amazon. And so you're thinking, well, what is a diffuser? That's the thing where you you put like a scent packet thing in it, pick a base, it's plastic. You put a little scent thing and you put some water in and then you let it go. And you have an app on your phone and you can decide like on your way home, like I want my house to smell like roses when I get home. So, you know, I'm going to start up the diffuser and it's going to smell beautiful when I walk in. And that's a really great thing. That's an awesome thing to have, right? But it can also kill you. Right? I don't like somebody. I put a chemical in there that will melt once I release my phone, and the person goes in and it kills all the life forms in the room. It kills, you know, you know, both plants and people or whatever. And that kind of technology. If you're a criminal justice student and you're learning how to investigate a crime scene, how would you even know to even look for that? How would you know? You wouldn't necessarily know. So this room is all about helping students think about the products that we have at our at our disposal and how they can be used for good and how they can be used for ill and what you should do if they if you ever come across something like that. What should you do if your fridge gets hacked? Um, the fridge we have has uh, three cameras in it. One of them um, looks inside at the contents. One looks outside uh, to the world, and then. Uh, there's one in the freezer, and um, people can hack into those cameras. So that means people can look at you through your refrigerator, your kitchen, in your you know your space that is your home. 
So what do we do about that? How would you know? What would you do if that happened? How should you stop it? So the kind of technology we have um, is interesting from a programming perspective and also from an ethical hacking perspective, but it's also interesting from a discussion perspective, the psychology of being watched all the time, the philosophy and ethical implications of being watched all the time, and the sociology of who has this kind of technology and who doesn't, sure have this, which parts of our society are, are limited to the access and exposure to this kind of technology. And that really is what the smart apartment is about and why it's also very that one. So you can read all of these uh, slides on your own, but there's um, some links here to uh, classrooms and medical devices, of, uh, tools that can work for good. So I always tend to lean on the scary side of internet of things because I want students to be safe. To be safe, but this technology is also amazing for people with alternate abilities. This um, kind of technology can empower people who might not otherwise have opportunities for that kind of empowerment. So there are good uses to this kind of technology. There are uh, risks, of course, with this kind of technology, and really this room sort of brings it all together. So. Um, there are some, some links out to some things that you can look at and some classrooms and we're seeing more and more of IoT in education. And so here are some trends in 2022. Um, there's no doubt that the growth of IoT will continue to grow, right? And 5G as 5G grows, the gro growth of IoT grows. Wearable technology, so uh, Google um, uh, has a smart coat, which has, um, you know, you tap on different parts of the coat and it does different things, like makes phone calls. It's called a uh, trucker jacket. It was designed for truckers with truckers in mind, so they could have hands-free calling and things like that. You can actually make wearables. You can make things that detect um, the temperature and report back. You can, um, you know, make things that talk to, you know, a shirt that talks to somebody else's shirt. There's all kinds of that technology. It's pretty easy to make. You know, it's it's not that expensive. And as you know, the years go on. When we look at the future, in 2021, there were more than 10 billion Internet of Things devices. By 2025, which is a few short years from now, there will be 152,000 IoT devices. And then it will surpass 25.4 billion in 2030. So this isn't going away. This is the future our students are facing. So how do we prepare them to be consumers, but also to be creators? IoT will impact every every aspect of the workforce, right? How do we prepare them to think critically about the technology? How do we help them to, um, you know, know what their industry uses and what might be on the horizon? How do we teach them to use that technology ethically? How do we help empower them um, if something goes wrong? How do you handle it? How do you address the issues? So the future of our students, uh, we have, you know, I, I believe that we have, an, you know, an opportunity really to help students think about their future and the technology that will be used. And it's interesting, the technology I'll be talking about today isn't really all that new. IoT's been around. Virtual reality has been around. You know, these technologies aren't brand new. Crypto is not, is not new. But we have to think about new ways to use this technology with our students to help them be successful in the worlds that they are going to walk into. So let's talk a little bit about any questions about IoT before I move on to artificial intelligence. Sandy, I will rely on you to. Uh, uh, nothing in the chat. Questions. Nothing in the chat. So artificial intelligence, we, we see it around us all the time. Siri, Alexa, smart assistants, self-driving cars, robo-advisors, conversational bots. We have those at Northampton. Uh, spam filters, Netflix recommendations. You know, when you're on Facebook and it recommends things that it's heard from, you talk about, you know, and you didn't think anybody was listening to you talk about it. That's artificial intelligence, right? And so that's been around four years, but we're starting to be able to use it as consumers on a consumer level. So it's no longer that some big company like, you know, like SpaceX is you know, handling artificial intelligence. <laughs> at our level to create and to uh, interact with artificial intelligence. 
quantum computing is a new way of computing. And again, not new. IBM um, has been doing this for quite a few years, but it's more and more accessible. And quantum computing is a, a little bit hard to wrap around because it it totally blows away the way that we think of it. So this is what I use with my students to explain it to them. If you take a quarter forever and ever in computing, we have we have programmed with ones and zeros, so heads and tails. Quantum computing is programming around the edge of that quarter, so it's infinite space. So things are faster, uh, uh, processes can happen faster, information can be gotten faster, um, things that used to take a long time to process through a computer are faster because we have more of these spaces that we can program on and so it's infinite. So it, it can solve bigger problems because at the speed at which um, things can process is a lot faster. So that's just the quarter example and you're thinking, well, why would I use this in my psychology class? Well, if things continue to get faster and faster, what does that do for helping people understand patience and stillness and you know, if we if things get faster and faster, you know, how do we put on the brakes? How do we help? How do we help our students think about issues when speed is is concerned in our culture, in our work processes, right? So knowing that com computing is getting faster and faster, you know, that's important for us all to know. Cryptocurrency is very very important and has been around. We've all heard of Bitcoin, but there are actually quite a few coins. Ethereum being another one. It's a non-physical coin and it can be split up into tiny little parts. Um, it can't be tracked unless there are actually ways to track it if it's, it's traded on the top web. But Bitcoin started in the dark web, which is part of the deep web. So if you think about an iceberg, and you think about the tip of an iceberg, that's what's called the top web. And that's what we use. And a good way to think about that is if, if something can be searched through Google, it's in the top web. Medical records, education records, things like that, that's all in the bottom web. And in the bottom web, that's stuff that can't be searched by Google. In that bottom web is this place called the dark web. And the dark web was actually started by the US Navy as a way to share files. So there's, there's nothing illegal about being on the dark web. There's nothing illegal about sharing information on the dark web, but it is untraceable because it uses the Tor um, browser, which is an onion layer. Um, so little pieces of onion, to, you don't, if you think about an onion and all the things that you peel back, that's what you have to go through to sort of get to the root. And so it's very, very difficult to trace back and not impossible, but it is difficult to trace uh, back to the original posting person. And that's where cryptocurrency started as a way to pay for illegal things on the dark web. So just like there's an eBay on the top web, there uh, is, a, it was called Silk Road. There's been many um, iterations of that. The first person who created, the person who created Silk Road has gone to prison, but there are other versions of that on the dark web and they don't exchange money, they exchange Bitcoin so that it's not traceable. Now we see Bitcoin being used in the top web and we see it being used in different countries and now we see it being used in the US as a way, as, as a currency. And so this whole new world, we're right at the beginning of it, the use of crypto. But as our students go into their futures, I see more and more crypto um, coins uh, coming into fruition and being used uh, to exchange goods and services. All right, any questions before I move on? Sandy, will you be my timekeeper too? Because I can't see my clock. Yeah, it, yeah. and this ends at, 11.05. Is that right? Is that right, 11.05? Yeah, I think so. Um, no questions. And no it's 10.45. 10.45, thank you. So augmented reality is pairing a digital asset with real life elements using overlay technology. So you can use your phone to hover over something kind of like a, um, a QR code Right at the store, you can do that and, and something appears. Um, and you can see some examples here used by Volkswagen and Boeing, right? And it's ways to solve problems. Augmented reality can be used in 2D, 
version, which is like your phone and something. And it can also be used in 3D, um, which is what the Boeing folks are doing in this picture. So uh, the Rolling Stones used um, augmented reality years ago now, 2012. They were using augmented reality, and it was a bonus if you if you got their um, their single for Gur. So Erasma, which is no longer around and has morphed into a new into a new company, um, the technology is there and pretty simple to use. We use a program called Roar at Northampton. We have um, some uh, projects coming up for diversity, equity, and inclusion that is um, called Diversity Unbound, and we're using augmented reality to um, host different um, uh, different examples or different stories or different people. Um, we're showcasing uh, these different um, speakers and stories and events um, using augmented reality to celebrate uh, all the different voices. Um, and it's a committee, it, it, was, provide, it was funded under um, a local uh, internal grant and it is a committee of people who wanted to participate and we're working through how that is gonna look on our campus. So it's, um, you know, Northampton has a commitment to DEI, the technology is there, students will like it and engage with it. And then we can also make a virtual component for people who can't come onto campus uh, so that they can experience the content as well. So, um, so um, augmented reality is very easy to reproduce and again, this like it's been around for a while, but we're still at the very beginning of these pathways for this technology. It'll get easier and easier, cheaper and cheaper, as our students enter the workforce. Beth, we have some so, comments. We have some comments. We have questions here. Or okay. comments. Questions. Okay, the first one. Perfect. The first one is from Kelly, who says robotic process automation. Many white gray collar mm -hmm. tests will be replaced with AI. Comment on that. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, that is that is a big fear, right? That a lot of jobs will be replaced with robots. And there is discussion on both sides of that issue about whether new jobs get created, right? Because you have to have people who build the robots. So yes, this job dies, but this job gets built. Um, and I do think, you know, there there will be some anxiety about that, right? Because the when we look at the jobs that get replaced by this kind of technology, it is the working class jobs, right? It's not administrators or things like that. It's people who, um, you know, are middle class or lower middle class. So there is a great concern about what happens to the workforce um, if their jobs are replaced. So that's another place for, you know, discussion with students, you know, and being able to retrain quickly for whatever the new job is, right? Is it, if, you, if your job was to put, I don't know, lids on a milk can and now a robot does that, or a, a bottle of milk, right? And now a, a robot does that. Do you retrain to be the person who runs the robot to do that? So, I mean, absolutely, you know, and, and I think it does cause, um, you know, my background's not psychology, but I do think it does cause some, um, some anxiety for people whose job it is to put, you know, lids on, on milk containers, right? I was thinking Kelly, more of the white call, like, you yeah, oops. Ahead, I was thinking no, even and... more of like accounting. I mean, I'm I'm talking about white collar jobs basically. Um, a lot of the routine, you know, oh, okay. a lot of task routines. So, yeah, I'm not even talking about the uh, which I don't. You know, I keep telling my students that. Um, you know, accountants, doctor, a lot of the routine kind of tasks. I think AI can learn some some of those. So, I think it's interesting anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> It's, it's absolutely interesting. I think it's, um, you know, I think a lot of you know, the, the way we work will change. And we've seen that during the pandemic too, right? We've seen that the way we work, you know, we all, at one time we thought that everybody had to be in the same space in order to get good work done. And the pandemic has taught us that we can be on the International Space Station and still get work done. That's not to say that we don't miss out on, on the great things that happen with interpersonal communication when you're in physical space. But you can get work done, and I think as we think about this new technology and how it displaces or replaces people, um, it'll be on us to be mindful of the needs of others, right? To be mindful of, especially the, you know the the white collar, blue collar, you know, issues that that come up, 
from the replacement or displacement of jobs. What so else you have, have for me, one, Sandy? One more question also from Amy. Uh, with the seed in your space features of some consumer goods websites <clears throat> fall into the AR category or is that something altogether different? I, I'm sorry, I, I, I think it glitched out a little bit in the middle of that question. So I uh, the seed in your space features of some consumer goods websites, would they fall into the AR category or is that something altogether different? Amy, can you come off your mic and and, that, and explain your question? I don't think I understand what what. Yeah, kind of what no. Um, is. you can you know if you're on um, looking at a new couch, you can see it in your space. Like you can click a button and then yeah. the phone will. Yeah, connect. IKEA has that Home Depot. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's is that AR or is that something different? That is augmented reality. Yep, that is okay. exactly what augmented reality is. Yep. Okay, yep. Just yep. trying to get so, a handle um, on, on these technologies and like what's what. You no, know, you got it. That's a great question. And we're seeing a lot more of it, like with Home Depot, even Walmart has an AR app now where you can like see if that couch will fit. You know, what will that couch look like in my space? <laughs> you know, that kind of wow. thing. And that's all augmented reality. Um, sometimes augmented reality and virtual reality sort of get um, mixed up. And they actually now call it extended reality or mixed reality when it kind of co combines a few different things. Um, so sometimes augmented reality stands alone, but sometimes it is mashed up with virtual reality. So it's a really good question because sometimes it isn't entirely clear which one it is. Good questions. Any other questions? Yes, Great. one more from Brian. Would Internet 3.0 affect the trajectory of AR? Internet 3.0. Oh, would it affect the trajectory of AR? Really good question. I don't know. <laughs> Brian, what do you think? What do you think? That's a good question. Because um, do you want to explain what, what you're talking about? Because I think that's a really good point. Yeah, what happens, as I understand it, with Internet 3.0, we're going to move away from sort of the, the current model of 2.0, which is a kind of consumer-based, you know, controlled by you know, the social media giants like Facebook and so on. And in 3.0, it'll be much more decentralized and controlled by groups that have common interests and things. And I just wondered if AR is going to take on a sort of a different meaning there, going to give people more of a, you know, a penetration into that, into that specialized mm -hmm. interest group, you know. It, 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 so that, I, I think it probably I, I will. I think it's interesting. I think it'll be, we'll have to wait and see, right? Yeah. Because it, the technology itself will get better too as the issue unfolds, right? And one of the, like, I think about, like, do you remember Google Glasses? The Google Glass? Uh -huh. Remember that? Yeah. And we all, or, or even if we think about, um, oh, what is the name of that? Uh, Microsoft's um, product. You know, yeah. we were all excited about the lens. We're all excited about these products, but who has them? Nobody. Right, like we all thought that the lens was going to be, or the HoloLens was going to be the end all be all, but none of us have access to it, right? And our students don't get to use it. And you have to like, in order to get it, like you have to be in the development team and even then you don't get it. I've been on the developer list for that forever. And, you know, I never get any email about it. It's like, it's hard because I think these things, we think they're going to have impact than they do. Like VR, when we think about the head reality and I'll talk about this in a minute but um, you know we thought the oculus or the headsets were going to be the end-all be-all until we realized that people can only really wear them for 15 minutes and that's what the American Medical Association uh -huh. recommends so it's not good to have people in headsets for long times and it isn't accessible to everybody because if you have motion sickness or things like that it can be very disorienting so while it's great technology and very useful in many places it isn't useful in every place, and so it isn't a solution to every problem, right? So I think when we think about 3.9 technology, I think folks can't get, they can't wrap their head around what that's going to look like, um, the Web 3.0, because we're still in 2.0. So I think the discussion about it, but also the tech, as we're discussing figuring that out, the technology is going to improve and change. So it'll be interesting to see how it takes out. But excellent question. 
And just finally, else, one, another uh, comment from Kelly, maybe the metaverse. Seems like you'll like this, Beth. Seems like Second Life coming back to life. It is. I'm actually in the process of building. Um, for those of you who've met me before, I've been with Second Life since 2007, having built over 77 literary sims in uh, Second Life and back on the teen grid when that was a thing. Um, and I've just uh, started build, rebuilding the House of Usher, and, and it's becoming more and more popular again. Um, it still remains the easiest to use of the virtual worlds. OpenSim is very good, but OpenSim is really connected to your university and only you can participate where something like Second Life, you know, you can meet with people all over the world. And there's a lot of work being done in the metaverse um, between educators um, who are very well connected um, that are really kind of bringing it back to life. And the ability now to put some of that into an Oculus 3D experience um, will will transform that technology once again. So I, I do I, I don't know that Second Life as a product platform will be necessarily the thing that moves forward, but the concepts so that underpin it. Email addresses. So internal. All right. So virtual reality um, is immersive reality. So your world is a different world. There's 2D and 3D. So 2D is tabletop. Your Second Life, you're on a computer and you are sitting somewhere and you're interacting in a virtual world. World of Warcraft, virtual reality um, can be a game, it can be, uh, but it's 2D. Um, 3D is when you wear the headset, the Oculus, the Vive, whatever. And, um, and both, um, you know, both have made exponential leaps and bounds in the past few years, but there are some advantages and disadvantages to both 2D and 3D. Um, I was very fortunate to work with um, Sales University where I teach as an adjunct, and uh, we had a grant from a coroner's, um, so from Pennsylvania coroner's uh, department, and uh, we had a grad student whose job it was to look at 2D virtual reality and 3D virtual reality of crime scenes. And then from a coroner's perspective, which of those technologies was more informational and which one was easier to access and use? And so um, 2D VR, tabletop, Second Life, something like that, it's very easy. Both of them have their own languages and scripting languages and the way that you build objects within them. But um, the grad student, and we picked a grad student who was good at computers but didn't know either language for either setting so that she could you know, see how quickly she could learn it and then use it. Um, in 2D VR, it's pretty, it's not easy, but it's easier to quickly build a crime scene we used a crime scene from new jersey um the john list case and so she built the crime scene and she had to learn the language and learn how to build in a short amount of time and was able to do that and then her job then was to learn how to do the same thing to build a very simple crime scene uh, that could be displayed in an oculus and that was near impossible within the time frame she was given because it's so much harder to learn that kind of programming and you need a whole team really at the end of the day you need a team of builders to build that kind of environment so, you know, her conclusion in her in her paper that she wrote was that the 2D reality is still, in her opinion, much more accessible and usable with students, with coroners in this particular case, because it was easier for her to learn to build that and get it out where um, she didn't have the vast technolo technological knowledge she needed to build in 3D. And we see that even in Olay, it's very easy for us to build 2D environments um, <coughs> using ThingLink and things like that, and using augmented reality and a mash of virtual reality. It's much easier to build that way than it is for me to make a 3D Dante's Inferno. That would take, um, you know, that would take so a bigger team of actual programmers to make that, and that would be very expensive. And you know, we don't have that kind of money at, at Northampton anywhere, I don't think. So that's, so so those are the differences. So just to give you, um, for those of you who might be new to this technology, 2D simulated world, flat images, 3D is everything is around you. And then sometimes that gets confused with 3D video, which is video that's captured using wide range cameras. Those cameras are often, that camera footage is often used to create 3D, but you can also have 3D like on YouTube, you can have, uh, you know, the 360 videos. That's not necessarily 3D, right? 3D is the, the 
moved and um, and when you're in with the headset on, you can touch them, you can manipulate your environment sometimes. Um, so it's a little bit different. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? I only I feel like I have only 10 minutes. There's right? just Five one minutes? more one more question here, and you have five minutes left. Um, from oh Anitra. I see AR being referred to as immersive. Is AR immersive reality as well? <laughs> so, um, I don't have the ability to mute anything. So, somebody's banging pots and pans, which yeah, sounds like I, fun. I can't see who has my I can't see who has their mic on. No. Um, so, can you repeat the question? So, um, is AR immersive? Immersive reality. Is AR immersive reality? It can be when it's mashed up with VR. VR, virtual reality, is the immersive um, because um, so yes and no, right? The so augmented reality is taking a physical object and adding a virtual reality to it. So it's a mashup of virtual reality in, in a way. So, you know, for example, uh, in, our, in our project that we're making for uh, Diversity Unbound, we're creating a hologram <coughs> using um, a thing that you sit on top of. Uh, it uses glass and, and you make a video and it creates a giant hologram. So if you've seen, you know, if you've seen a concert and they brought in a hologram of somebody, that's the Pepper's ghost effect that they use at, um, at the Haunted Mansion, for example, at Disney. So um, that technology is both VR and AR, right? So you're using augmented reality because it's a physical object and a digital asset, um, but then we're going to create a, a 3D virtual human. Hopefully our new president will agree to be our speaker and we'll create that and hopefully it'll be life-size and we'll make that in our fab lab out of sheets of glass. I don't know if that answered the question very well. I hope so. All right, so what is the future of higher education? And, and I'll provide links to all these things. If you have the opportunity, please take a moment to um, click around in these slides because there's all kinds of links. One of my very favorite movies that I watch, and I, I, I usually show it if I have a longer time, it's just a two minute clip, is from Virgin Galactic's president. So for anybody here who's a music fan, Virgin Galactic, Virgin started off as a record company that produced um, musical acts that the mainstream would not produce. The Sex Pistols, if you're old enough to know who they are, right? So they have always been on the on sort of the cutting edge in music. And so they created a way for all of us to go to space, right? So up until now, you had to either be an astronaut or you had to get a job with SpaceX, right, to, to go up into space, but you had to be trained as an astronaut. And Virgin Galactic's president said, hey, what if we just take people to space? They can't get out, they can't get off, but we can take them around for 15 minutes, they can take pictures of the Earth, and then we'll bring them back down. They don't have to be trained as astronauts, they do have to be trained you know, for, for weightlessness, but we could take them up as a vacation, and we'll charge them $250,000 to do it. <laughs> and so Virgin Galactic now runs commercial flights or vacation flights up into space. And so when you think about, when I think about the jobs of the future, I think, wow, we teach hospitality at Northampton, can you imagine the the, um, the stewards on these on these flights of the future? Like they're going to have to be trained how to I don't know how you serve drinks and and pretzels like in space. Like how do you do that, right? But then you know also jobs at SpaceX. You know it used to be that you had to have a military commission to work at or be a contractor with the military to work for places like NASA. Well now, SpaceX is a business. And our students may have the opportunity to work there. So what do they need to know about all of this technology that didn't exist 20 years ago that exists today, right? So if you have an opportunity, definitely watch a letter to my uh, grandchildren um, by the president of Virgin Galactic. Um, but also think about the way that solar is impacting our communities and culture. It's how robotics, time. I mean, robotics, is it ro uh, robotics, it's artificial 11 intelligence? 1105. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Pray let you go into the wild.
I appreciate so much that you came and I love talking about this stuff. There is um, uh, a chat right after this. If people want to hang out and chat in the chat room, I posted a little afterwards chat. I do. If you're not going to that, I definitely want to send some props out to my colleagues at Northampton uh, in the CTLT. We'll be talking about how we do amazing professional development things through our CTLT. And that's a, a very good group of uh, folks that'll be talking there. So um, if you don't go come to our chat session, definitely pop into there.